few Bible, if you want to take a look at the scripture this morning, maybe you have your Bible in hand, uh, and you can follow along with whatever translation you might be holding in your hand this morning. But beginning at verse 14, and Jesus is telling this parable, and listen to it carefully. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise he would receive two and gain two more also. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled the accounts with them. So he who received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter to the joy of your Lord. He also who received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I gained two more talents beside them. So the Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now recognize right there that whether it was five talents or two talents, the, the, the words of the Lord are the same. The recognition of the Lord to each one of these servants is the same. Then he would receive the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited it my money, even with the bankers, and at my coming I would receive back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him, and give it to the, to the one who now has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he who has abundance from him also does he have, even when he has been taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, in a few moments, we're going to kind of work through this parable to understand what it's trying to say. But if you were to ask me, what is the most famous parable that Jesus ever told? Now, again, I'm speaking from my own personal opinion. I would say it's the parable of the prodigal son. We're all familiar with this. In fact, some of us maybe have played the role of the prodigal. Others, as we've raised the family, know that maybe one of our children have followed it in suit. Literature has actually called this parable the world's most perfect short story. It's been told and retold around the world because of its universal application. Almost every family knows of some such experience. So, this is probably the most famous of all the parables. Now, if you were to ask me what is the most tender parable Jesus ever told, I'd probably say the parable of the lost sheep. The shepherd went out looking for that sheep that had gone astray, searching over countrysides, rugged hills, risking really his own life in search for that sheep. As he went through the thickets and jagged rocks, he finally finds it. And then he brings it home rejoicing and serves everyone lamb chops that night. I thought that was just my own translation. That's not the way it goes. The sheep is rescued and placed with the others. Or if you're to ask, what is the most comforting story, even though it's not a parable, although sometimes it's kind of looped into the parables, it's an actual story, but what's the most comforting to those that are helpless, I say it's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. You see, Lazarus sat out of the city gate. His clothes were tattered and torn. His body was wracked with disease and in much pain. Dogs had 
says, even Cain and licked his own sores. The only food he had came out of the garbage pails from the rich man's table. Then he died, but he found himself in Abraham's bosom. There, all of his misery was finally over, and he saw an eternity that was free of pain and free of suffering. And you and I have learned through this account that when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, there's going to be pain and suffering here below. We cannot escape that. That's just part of life. But don't you have great hope for eternity? When every tear shall be wiped from our eyes and there is no more sorrow and pain. It's all short-lived in comparison to eternity. The Apostle Paul speaks of that, that our light affliction, I will soon be gone. Ah, and the joy, the joy of heaven itself, that can't even be explained. But you were to ask, what is the most practical parable Jesus ever told? I think it's this parable. Because it applies to how we live our lives today. I think this parable of Matthew 25 has a lot to say. And so let's take a look at it. It first of all talks about the master entrusting his wealth to us. So scene one opens up where the master calls in his servants. And he says to them, I'm going to give you each, according to your ability, certain talents. I'm going to distribute my wealth among you. So he gives five talents to one individual, two talents to another, and then I come along and I get one. Okay. But you know what? It's talents, money, dollars. They're all synonyms for the very same thing. It is God's money in the beginning, is it not? It belongs to him from the very start. So in this parable, he distributes his wealth among them. And he says that while I'm gone, I want you to be good stewards of what I just entrusted to you. He is the master. They are the servants. He owns everything. Technically, they own nothing. So they depend upon him. And if he's not generous with them, they really won't be able to survive at all. So now he calls them in. And he says, I have been watching you. I have studied you. I have concluded that you are faithful servants. Now, I'm not sure how many servants this master had. There could have been a host of them. But he pulls in these three servants in regard to what he wants to distribute to them. So he says to them, I'm going away, and as I leave, this is what I'm placing in your hands. Take good care of it. That's the end of scene one. Now, we can draw some very quick parables that are very easy to understand. We realize that the master represents God, who does have everything and owns everything. God was the very giver of life that you and I enjoy today. You and I here in this place are the servants. Every day, we depend upon his blessings just in order to even breathe or to see, or to think. We are the servants of God. And aren't you so glad he is willing to distribute his wealth among us? It's not just financial wealth. We understand that. It goes beyond that. The very abilities and talents that he's given us. Now, I know we have a sketchy praise team up here this morning because of vacations, but aren't you so appreciative of our praise team that they use their talents to help us and lead us in worship? And for those that were taking over all the responsibilities while Penn and I were gone, we can't say thank you enough that you stepped up and you minded God in that area. But there's something else I want you to understand. God is always studying your life to see how faithful you are going to be. You know, one of the alarming parts of the story is that he didn't give the servants the same amount. Drats. There goes socialism right down the tubes. <laughs> he didn't give everyone five talents. He gave one five 
one, two, and another one he gave one. And you and I are saying, that's just not fair. Why would he do that? Well, it all makes sense when you come to verse 15. It says he gave them talents according to what? Their ability. Their measure of faith and their measure of able to handle what he's given them. Now, if he had given one talent to the five talent man, would it have been not really a good use of his abilities? I mean, it would have really frustrated the five talent man to only have one to work with. And what if he would have given five talents to the one talent man? He'd been overwhelmed. He wouldn't have known what to do. He wouldn't know how to handle that. But because the master knew his servants, he gave each one what he knew that one could handle. And then he left it up to them to be faithful with it, to use it for the right purpose. That's the way God works in your life and in my life. He doesn't rehearse us. He doesn't constantly look over our shoulders. He gives us the abilities that he knows you and I can handle, and then with wonderful expectations, he entrusted to us, hoping that you and I will be faithful with it. But now we come to scene two. The master returns and requires an accounting. When the master comes back, the five-talent man comes in. First thing he says is, I took the five talents, I invested them, and believe it or not, I received five more, and he gives all of that to the Lord. Here's all ten of these talents. And what does the Lord say? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I am not going to trust you anymore. I can give you more responsibilities. The two talent man came in and said, look, Master, you've given me two talents. I also have invested them. And they have doubled. And I'm giving you the return of that investment. And the same is said to this servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful over a few things, I now can give you more. And then the one talent man kind of scuttles in and says, Lord, I knew that you were a hard master. I know that you reap what you've not sown. So I kind of wrap the talent up and I bury it in the ground. So here it is. No scratches. No mildew. I clean it all up. It's just exactly the way you gave it to me. And what does the master say about this individual? He calls them wicked and lazy. And in verse 30, a worthless servant that needs to be thrown out into utter darkness where there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, as we have just listened to all this, we're kind of thinking, that is a tough parable. I mean, it really kind of bothers us, this parable, because I think that most of us here today would identify with the one count person, would you not? My hand's up in the air. I identify with the one talent person, much more than the five talent or the two talent. Because the one talent person almost seems to be the ordinary person, a lot like who you and I actually are. And he did something that wasn't all that smart and very, and we understand that, but he didn't steal the talent. He didn't embezzle it. He gave it back, right? He said, okay, he gave me one. Here it is. And he presented it just the way he received it. Well, before we get into the real application, let's ask ourselves a question. Why did the one talent man bury the talent in the first place? Well, I can only really speculate on the first thing I'm going to mention, but I think he buried it because he felt a little inferior. When you're rubbing shoulders with five-talent individuals and two-talent individuals, and you see them rubbing shoulders with five-talent individuals and two-talent individuals, and you're just a one-talent person, don't you feel a little inferior yourself? Don't you just kind of want to step back and say, wow, I 
don't have an attendance. When you see people doing things with just grace and ease, where you have to really struggle, you have to put forth all kinds of energy just to function, don't you feel like you're a little beneath the scale when you look at these individuals? And most of us would probably put ourselves into the categories I already mentioned of the one talent person. Well, there's a problem itself. The problem is when we're looking at other people, we get our eyes off of God, don't we? We're measuring ourselves up to somebody else. That was never God's intent. And that's what happened with this individual. He's measuring himself up with the servants around him. Secondly, and this is really what the parable says, so I'm not speculating here, he says that he was afraid. He was afraid because he had analyzed his master and came up with the wrong estimation of him. He came up saying, you're a hard master. Man, you are so hard that I was scared to death of making any mistake with this one talent. He didn't understand the true nature of the master. You and I know that God has expectations. God does require from us obedience and faithfulness. The word of God also presents before us how we need to conduct our lives, what is right and what is wrong. But in all that being said, we also know that God is gentle and understanding and forgiving and merciful. This man didn't understand that part of God's character. Therefore, he was afraid and buried his talent in the eye. What if the one talented man had actually invested his one talent? You know the answer to that, don't you? The same would have been said to him as the other two. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He would be considered doing what he was supposed to do with what was entrusted to him. But let me ask another hypothetical question. What if the one talented man had actually invested his talent and lost it? I mean, just made a bad business deal. And the master came back and was like, ah, man. You know, the parable never suggests that idea. Why? Because as best as I understand, and you can correct me after the service if I'm wrong, God never commands us to be successful. Nowhere in Scripture do I read, if you try and fail, I'm going to condemn you. What does God ask of us? to be obedient, and to be faithful. Because by the world's standards, there have been a host of Christians who have lived and died for Christ from their standard were not successful at all. So God isn't looking at success from the worldly standard. What he's looking at is our commitment to him, our surrender to him, and allowing him to be used in our lives however he deems best. And I also understand when we invest, God brings the increase anyway. It's not up to us. It's not anything we've done. God brings it to pass. Think of this for a moment. Nearly 46 years ago, a young man came and became the pastor of Turnpike Wesleyan Church. His name was Ralph Chapman. He was a minister of a church that probably back then would it be considered a one-talent church? If you're new to this congregation, all you need to do is look out the window and you can see the original church built back in 1851. That's where Turnpike Wesleyan started, right down the road. But there's a big difference in what took place. The pastor and the people, they knew they were ordinary. They knew that they were not exemplary. They knew that they also had God on their side. So they were not afraid. They took their one talent and they invested it for God. Now, sure, there are probably some who wanted to bury that talent in the backyard thinking that doing anything outside the four walls of that little church was too 
too much to ask. And I'm not even sure that if my memory is correct, they only ran about 70 people at the time that they made this wonderful decision to relocate. And we're in the very church that was the dream and the vision of a one talented congregation because they honored God. But what would happen if they took that one talent and buried it? Do you know there's a lot of one talented churches across the land that close their doors because they did not have God? They no longer exist. My wife and I came here from Arkansas, from Rogers, Arkansas. That church decided never to reach out among its four walls. That church no longer exists. It's been sold. Thank you for bringing us here. <laughs> we may have been sold to the property. Who knows? <laughs> And what happens to other churches that end up bearing the talent? God's blessing is taken away from such churches. So you see, a decision time is before us once again. Do we take the added talents that God has placed upon us and reinvest them? Or do we bury them? I'm so glad that you people at Turnpike Wesleyan have chosen to reinvest. You see, I'm convinced that God is going to bring increase to our church because we have a vision that's greater than ourselves. We have a vision that only God can accomplish. And therefore, I say thank you for holding on to that vision. And you know that if you're new here, we're planning to build a family life and activity center. And my thinking is, of course, it's just my thinking, but by spring, we might be breaking ground for such a venture as this together. But understand, if we're faithful, then let God do what God needs to do. Let's not push. Let's not walk ahead of God. He will do the work. All he's looking for is our obedience. You don't lose talents by investing them. You lose talents by marrying them. When you invest anything that God has given you, God will always honor that investment. There are thousands of churches across our land that one time were eight talented churches, but they buried their talents and now they're empty shells. Do you know that there was one church on this particular district in the very city of Albany that was a very solid, energetic church one of our own general superintendents came out of that church, Dr. Earl Wilson. Today, that church is closed. <laughs> we have no Wesleyan presence in Albany. Why? Because they buried their talent. Now, allow me to wrap up by making a personal application. I'm going to have the praise team come back to the platform. There are thousands of Christians who have reached a certain level of maturity in their Christian faith and they became self-satisfied and complacent. They decided that they didn't need to grow anymore, or pray anymore, or study anymore, and they started dying spiritually because they were burying their talents. The principle never changes. All the way through Scripture, Jesus constantly challenges us to invest and reinvest again and again in the kingdom. And he will always honor that investment. He will never honor those who are afraid and bury their talents in the backyard. So the message of the parable is not changed. God is still the master. He is still the giver of all good things. Without his generosity, you and I would have nothing. So where do our talents come from? They come from God. They are his. So he says, invest what I've given you and see what will happen. So for you who are here today that are followers of Jesus Christ, here's the invitation. Maybe you've leveled off in your Christian life. Maybe the word of God doesn't have the power in your life as it once had. And you just need to say, Lord, I'm going to stand before you in a few moments and rededicate my life to you. Maybe your prayer life is dwindling. And you're not sacrificially giving anymore. You're not 
sharing your faith with others, you really realize today, hey, I've buried whatever talent or talents God has given me. Well, I would say now is the moment we soon stand and sing together. They can drag up those talents, get them out of the ground, and start using them for the Lord. But maybe you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. Hey, I've got good news for you. God's not left you out talent-wise. But in order to use them appropriately, properly, and purposefully, you need to have a relationship with Jesus. So when we stand to sing, if you want to know more about how you can walk with Jesus, invite him into your heart and life, we welcome you to come to the altar. There are those here that will meet with you, pray with you, and help you in this decision-making process. So let's stand together. The invitation is there before you as we sing, Do Not Tear.